as well as um, analytics. And we'll be covering today on digital strategy with Michael Helbling about building empathy as an analyst. So if you're on this call or watching this recording and are not already part of the SDEC, um, it is free to join. So I'll paste a link where you can see it in the chat where you can join the SDEC as well as our Slack group. Um, so if you have any questions during the presentation today about joining, um, feel free to message me in the chat. If you have any questions for our presenter, Michael, today, just put those in the question and answer section here in Zoom and we'll get to those at the end. So now I will hand it over to Michael. Thanks so much for presenting with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for uh, thank you, the SDEC, for having me today. And feels like coming home a little bit. So it's kind of nice. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Yeah, as, um, as Julie mentioned, I'm Michael Helbling. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Stacked Analytics, which is an expert collective in the data and analytics space. Today, I want to talk a little bit about um, how empathy works as it relates to sort of what we do in analytics. And um, it's sort of got some different points to it. So we we'll just get jump into it and we can kind of find our way through it together. Obviously, I'd love to answer any questions and things like that as we as we go along. So first, just to set the stage, I think probably it's good to try to go back and do a little bit of definitional work around what we're talking about, right? So empathy, uh, basically, you know, we can think of it lightly, loosely as, you know, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another person, right? And so, um, you know, if you um, are feeling sad, then I might be like, oh, I'm sorry that you feel sad. And maybe I sort of feel sad because you feel sad and so, so on and so forth. And then if we, knock that down just a little deeper, there's different types of empathy. So like different researchers and psychologists have done a lot of work on this. And so they've kind of broken it down into some various components. Um, so the first sort of component is what's called cognitive uh, empathy. And that means basically that you're aware or you know how the other person feels logically, right? I, I see that, I understand what's going on. I see the feeling, I can see it, I understand it. Emotional empathy means that you go so far as to sort of share that feeling, right? So it's sort of the, that's sort of what differentiates this from so like sympathy, right? Sort of the similar emotions. And then um, compassionate empathy is sort of the idea of a combination of cognitive and emotional that moves us to act uh, to help or to move on behalf of that person. So I'm trying to fit my notes and everything inside of all the different little boxes I have open. So apologize. So I can see everything. And so if we look at it today, like we're probably going to talk a lot about the first two and primarily when um, psychologists kind of talk about empathy, they're going to be talking a lot in a business context. We'll talk a lot about it as cognitive empathy and probably cognitive empathy is also the way that you could think about the one that's most open to our um, intervention. Like we can do the most with it. We can build skills around it. We can expand it. We can, we can grow it. And then um, lastly, there's sort of different kinds of empathy and we're primarily talking about what's called situational empathy uh, as opposed to what's called dispositional empathy, which basically just means Situational empathy is, um, you know, I, in a certain situation, I have a set of skills, social skills that allow me to be empathetic, and I bring those skills to bear in that situation, as opposed to dispositional empathy, which is more of like, uh, you know, what's my personality type, what are my character traits, those kinds of things are more deep seated in terms of like who I am as an individual. So hopefully that kind of layers it out a little bit better just to understand empathy. Cause a lot of times I think people talk broadly about, yeah, you gotta be empathetic or empathy is good. And we don't really hone in necessarily on exactly what we mean. So I wanted to start us off uh, by doing that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about our very unique profession. At least I like to think our profession is somewhat unique. 
because I I heard it said I was at the um, I was uh, lucky enough to go to the Digital Analytics Association's one conference last week, and somebody there uh, said something. It was like, as analytics people, we rarely are in a position to actually be doing the thing that the business does. Right, sort of we're sort of always trying to get something to happen through our influence or things like that to impact the business. And so that's a little bit unique. A lot of functions in the business actually do a function of the business. So we're kind of influencing, if you will, the function of a lot of businesses. And so that's sort of a little bit of a, of a unique set of parameters that we find ourselves in as professionals that a lot of other people don't necessarily run into. And I think that actually is useful and probably speaks to some of what you might find is some of the disconnects or in, in our industry, you know, there's a really sh a common shared theme of not feeling like you're having as much impact as you would like or being heard within your organization the way you'd like to. And I think that's, this has something to do with it. There's, there's keys to that there. And so if we go into that a little bit and we think about what it is that we are bringing to the table, right? Data is a representation of some other thing, right? The real world, the website, um, the, the future purchasers of our product, what, whatever it is, the data we create when we build out into statistical models and those kinds of things, they are uncertain as they are a representation of what we think is gonna happen or what we think has happened, right? So that's sort of the underlying thing. Well, there's a real problem with uncertainty uh, because the brain is works in a, the brain, the human brain works in a really specific way. And that is the brain looks at uncertainty and, and things it doesn't understand and it catalogs it as error. And basically when that happens, the walls go up. It's like, well, until this error is resolved, we cannot go back to a steady state or, or um, something like that is normal. And so basically when you present your uncertainty, right, which is everything we do, none of what we do has certainty to it. Tim Wilson does a really good job explaining that uncertainty of statistics and things like that. But that means that every time we walk into a room with our data, in our analysis and our insights, uh, we are basically triggering a really important response in a lot of people that they might not even realize. It's probably really important for us to realize just so that way we can do something about it. But basically, their brains are asking, is this person a threat to me or not? Uh, and so that's a real big problem. It's almost like we're already behind and we haven't even gotten started. Um, this quote is one I just really love, and it goes back to this concept as well, which is um, so much of decision making. So not only are we sort of in a world where our representation of the world we're trying to describe through data is uncertain, right, and that and therefore creates a threat to people, but people don't actually arrive at decisions most of the time in a logical fashion. Uh, decision making and the study of decision making, um, it's really fascinating. And what you will see when you study that is that while all the evidence is really important, the emotions that the person has around the decision are actually of equal and sometimes even more importance. Um, and so basically it's whatever the decision maker is feeling is gonna matter to how they make the decision. So how do you make that decision maker feel? Uh, that's going to actually impact what they decide and how they listen to you and what they do with the data you're presenting. Um, and then, you know, basically, if people are making decisions emotionally, they're not going to make a different decision unemotionally, right? So that's why I like that quote so much. And so as we move through that, we really are presented with some pretty unique problems as it pertains to um, being effective. And this is where empathy becomes our path, right? So we basically can use empathy to start to move from being a threat to being a friend, to being a trusted advisor and someone who's on the side of 
the decision makers, the good ones. There's bad decision makers out there. Terrible. Um, and and we can work with them to do that. And so by growing our skill set, uh, our empathetic skills, this is actually the way that we reduce this natural barrier of the human brain to what it is that we um, want to propose or what we want a business or a team to decide, right? So if we want them to change course or things like that. So that's, that's kind of um, sort of what's unique about us. We sort of have a, a kind of a unique uh, set of components that make us up. All right, so um, let's get into how do we then become empathetic? Um, I hope you'll agree with me that this sounds like at this point probably a good thing for us to do. Um, so it's interesting. There's a study, there's lots of studies that get done and I'm not a psychologist. I'm not even um, um, a scientist most of the time. I, well, I try to be scientific, but you know what I mean? Like I just, anyway, but one study that was done back in 2015 um, called Emotions in Everyday Life, they looked at how often people feel emotion. And I think what's interesting is they came up with about 90 different emotions per day. Um, the cool thing is um, Saturdays had more positive emotions than negative ones. So I don't know, you know why that might be, but I have some suspicions um, why that might be. <laughs> Anyway, but what's important to take away from that is like we all, this is all of us, you too, you also have 90 emotions or you're feeling about 90 emotions a day um, of all kinds, of every different kind. And so one of the most important things, and it's sort of interesting because it's, it's sort of intuitive when you think about it, which is your emotions matter in this too. So building empathy and understanding the emotions of others has a requirement on you and your emotions. And so that's one of the first things to do is start to work on building out an awareness of your own emotions and responses in, in the first place. So it, it's actually in terms of like things like um, the word emotional intelligence of which I'm not really a fan um, there's the concept of self-awareness and sort of like, I feel this feeling and why do I feel this way and what do I do about it? That's the thing I'm talking about is building the awareness of my own emotional state. I think it's also really important to maybe just take a quick pause here for a second and, and recognize, and what I hope is an empathetic way, that all of us are starting from a very different place with this process. And not everybody, like a lot of things affect our ability to recognize and, and understand and deal with their own emotions. And so you shouldn't compare yourself. You shouldn't look at this and be like, I should do this on whatever. This is a process for you, but it is the process because it, what I've found is that in my own life, and I think this applies broadly and I've looked for research and I haven't found it. So I'm gonna keep looking is that my awareness of my emotional state and my ability to process that emotional state is directly related to my ability to engage in empathy and take on an understanding of someone else's emotion. So in other words, if I'm over here with my emotion and it's sort of running through my brain, I'm less likely to be able to pick up on someone else's emotion. I think that makes sense. And I've, I've certainly observed that personally, and I'm looking for the information that will share, show me that more broadly, but I, I kind of believe it to be true. So don't take that as science yet, but that's more of a personal observation or an anecdote at this point. But it makes sense to me because my brain's processing my emotions or not, or as the case may be not processing them if I'm not aware. And behind this, the picture I put up is a thing called an emotions wheel which is actually a really great diagnostic tool. Um, you can actually take uh, the emotions wheel and you can make a little printout and you can actually just, I, what I do with it is I go and I circle different emotions that I'm feeling at that moment. If I'm, if I'm having like a rough time or if I'm struggling to identify the emotions, I actually go and I search for 
what did I feel? And I try to be more specific. And what is very interesting is that just by doing a process like that, it actually does a ton to help resolve or mitigate or process those emotions. It's not a full, like you got to do your process. But what's interesting is that just by acknowledging that that emotion exists is a very powerful first step to getting you into a place where you can actually see somebody else. And I think there was a question of somebody wanted to see the whole thing and we'll, we can try to uh, provide a link or something to that, but you can actually just do a Google search for an emotions wheel. There's a bunch of examples on Google. Um, it, I think it was invented. Oh, I forget the name of the, the fellow who invented it. Um, but actually writers use it a lot to pick emotions for characters and their stories and books. But, but I think it's a really great tool for anybody who wants to try to do that. And I also think it's useful for something else, which we'll get to in a minute. But that's the first step is actually looking at your own emotions and trying to do that. Because what are all the feelings I feel when I feel like someone's not listening to me in a meeting or not listening to the analysis that I've worked so hard to create or the recommendation that I know is correct and that as a business, we're going to be damaged if we don't pay attention to this reality. Um, I feel a lot of emotions as a result of that kind of an interaction that I need to be able to work through so that I can keep pushing for the outcome that I'm hoping for. The second thing, the next thing we want to do is we want to collect and analyze data, which is right up our alley. It's so perfect for us who work in data and analytics, find a way to actually keep records of this. That could be, uh, you know, it's funny that I say it like this, but then the next thing I'm going to say is going to sound so, um, um, I don't know what the right word is, but keeping a journal is literally what I'm talking about potentially, right? Or making notations or, you know, had meeting with this person seemed like I wasn't capturing the attention of so-and-so, not sure what to take from that. I'm going to try to dig in deeper or whatever. Or, man, that meeting went really poorly. Basically, my um, um, you know, my, um, my suspicion is that, you know, this person, you know, doesn't like me or didn't like what I had to say. Whatever, whatever, we, whatever we can do to start to collect and analyze the data, not just of ourselves, but also of the people we're interacting with. So it's, it's sort of like, um, where do I kind of collect that? And then also start to learn what lies beneath certain emotions, because not um, a lot of times people don't even know how to tell you the emotion that they're feeling, or you can also struggle to identify emotions yourself. I remember um, I was having a conversation with, um, at that time, my therapist who asked me a question. He said, Michael, how do you process anger? And I was like, oh, no, no, I don't get angry. And anybody who's ever worked with me, I mean, I'm not, I don't yell at people. I'm not a big, you know, I don't get angry like that in my person. I felt that I was sort of not an angry person. And it was a good challenge because yeah, basically it encouraged me to sort of like take a closer look, look again, see if you have any. And then I started looking, I was like, oh, I have anger or frustrations with people and things and I don't process it at all. Like basically I was ignoring it and acting like it wasn't there, which turns out not super healthy. And so that was like a huge thing that I learned that it was not just that it was like learning to figure out what emotion it was, but also that I just had a blocker in terms of knowing that I even experienced that emotion in the first place. And then other people will exhibit behaviors and things that might lend you to think, oh, they're really upset, but actually maybe they're just afraid. And if you think about so much of what we do for our work, um, our job is to ask people to change and change is fear inducing, right? It makes people afraid it can. Uh, and so we're always dealing with this challenge of trying to figure out well, what's going on with this person. And so that's why we collect and analyze data, not just about the people, but also more broadly about ourselves and our interactions with those people. And sometimes, you know, you get along great with someone naturally, 
And it's really good to try to figure out why. And sometimes it's really hard to get along with somebody. It just seems like we butt heads every single time. That's also good to figure out why. Why is it that it just seemed like this person rubs me the wrong way every time? What behaviors, what things are happening? What are they doing? What am I doing? Those are all great data points because that's the analysis that we want to do to start to figure out where we want to go from there. So then, because it's a skill, especially the cognitive, uh, if you'll remember from earlier, the cognitive empathy that we've been talking about, that is a skill we can start to optimize over time. So we literally just did that, remember the old days of analytics when we had the big circle, the um, you know collect data, observe, analyze, act, or something like that. I don't know, different companies and people had different versions of it, but we're basically taking that model and we're just applying it to this, this process, right? Since we're data people, this is sort of a weird kind of data, but it is data nonetheless. And we can actually optimize and create a skill around building up at least a cognitive empathy around those specific things. And so that's kind of the, the nice thing about it is I don't think it's actually to the way that we naturally as analytical people think and act, it's not as foreign as we might initially think. And I think sometimes it can feel like such a huge hurdle. Um, and, and again, I wanna create a lot of space for people coming from many different places, right? So that it's not the same for everybody. It's always a little different. So let's, let's get some practical tips and tricks. So we kind of walk through a process, but we didn't really talk about what to do in super detail. So the first thing is um, there's actual ways you can expand your empathy. And it's very interesting. Um, there's actually research around most of this stuff. And you can actually grow your empathy by doing various things. And so if we're committed to this process, then we probably will jump in and we'll, we will approach some of these with some more interest maybe than we have before or we'll see them and be like, oh, that's right, that totally makes sense. So the first is maintain curiosity. I think you know people always talk about what makes what's a good trait of an analyst? What makes a great analytical person? It's their curiosity, right? They don't come to final decisions on things. They wanna see if it actually is true. They wanna apply methods to it and see like, does this actually make sense? Here's the thing about curiosity with people. If you're curious, about what is happening, it is much harder for you to have made a final judgment. So um, that is literally gonna help you with empathy, right? Because if, if you sort of like, well, that person is just, they're opposed to everything we're doing. And frankly, I kind of think they're not that intelligent. And we get done with that decision-making and they're probably making a similar decision about you. We're not gonna make any progress. Nothing will happen. No change will happen because uh, we haven't maintained any curiosity. And again, like this is a two-way street, right? N none of this, ideally, right? Whoever you're working with in the business or whatever, someone out there is telling them the same thing I'm telling you, hopefully, like empathy for the marketer, empathy for the operations leader, empathy for the CMO, and all that. Everyone agrees. And that's really research shows empathy creates really big business outcomes, um, sometimes it's between 25 to 90% improvements in profit because of a focus on empathy um, across different businesses. There's not uh, a number that sort of sticks to what we do, but if you think back to like the really old Forrester research from way back in 2007 that tried to quantify the, the business impact of a web analyst back at that time, now digital analyst or, or whatever, there were between a thousand and three thousand uh, percent of impact or ROI on just on one analyst, and so if you take that number, even if you pare it down a little bit, your impact, if you're able to bring some of these things to bear, is just only going to be magnified. So first, maintain your curiosity. It's just a state of mind of sort of continuing to be curious. It's hard. That's really hard, especially when the things start going two ways, right? So easy to be curious about what's going to happen before somebody says something mean or, or nasty to you. Much harder to maintain your curiosity after you kind of get punched in the mouth a little bit. Um, and I 
have lived through those and have had to learn to reassert my curiosity about a person um, by kind of trying to see them as as human again, I guess, is the way that I describe it. I want to see their humanity is the kind of the way I describe it. The other next thing is widening your circle. The more different kinds of people you can interact with, the more empathy you'll create because you'll see that there's so many differences. And this is where just getting the opportunity to travel if you can is an awesome opportunity, but also just put yourself purposefully in situations where you're going to be around people who are not like you. You know, maybe it's new activities, maybe it's new communities, whatever the case may be. And this is actually why, for me, why um, a focus on diversity and growing um, how our community as analytics people, our industry and all those things is actually super important because it actually ties right into this. The more people, different kinds of people we can interact with and understand and build empathy for, the more we're gonna have even more empathy around for um, those other people. Then interestingly enough, literature. So if you think about it, literature is basically the exploration of the human psyche in a lot of cases, right? It's sort of why people do what they do, their decisions and motivations in the concept and the construct of a story. And so by reading literature, even though it's not real people, it actually is your brain practicing to be empathetic. And so by reading literature, you actually build empathy um, by reading, um, reading books. So I don't know, it doesn't say anything about books on tape, but I assume books on, you know, like audio books and stuff. I hope that works too. I'm more of a read a book person, but there are a lot of people are audio book people. And then interestingly enough, learning another language, um, especially in children, for whatever reason, uh, research has shown that is a huge factor in building empathy, but I think it works in adults as well. So these are just some ways that you can actually build empathy. They're very practical, right? You don't have to be fancy um, or really smart or anything. You can just go, you know, read a great book of literature and hang out with people who, you know, aren't in your circle and do different things than you and just absorb that or, you know, be curious about it. And then in conversations, when you're seeing this sort of thing happens, there's all these cues that are going on. And this is a whole talk in and of itself. Like you could just go for hours on body language and questions and um, reactions and all those different things. But there's some couple things that I've always tried to do to demonstrate that I'm, I'm trying to be empathetic or I'm having empathy for this person. One is I try to recognize and enunciate what I think I'm seeing. So sometimes someone doesn't say something, but you observe something. So maybe you start with, yeah, it looks like something isn't sitting quite right with you. And you try to pull a response out of somebody. So maybe they're like, you know, having those little cues or whatever, or maybe they pulled their phone out halfway through your presentation and they're just looking at it. Like, oh, it looks like, you know, this isn't hitting where you uh, wanted to. Can you talk a little bit about what you were hoping for here? And, you know, then suddenly you're creating a connection and, and hopefully you're building some rapport. Um, seems like you have some real concerns. If somebody brings concerns, could you help me understand better? Blah, 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 blah. And off we go. Because again, the person who made the decision with their emotional state, and now we're asking them to use some of our logic and our data to change how they do that decision-making process. That's a threat. Change is scary. So let's let's just say what do we think it is and, and approach them with this spirit of, let me help you. Let me try to figure out how to help you. And then when somebody does share a concern, you always want to be thankful that they were willing to share. In a certain sense, that's risk, right? So anytime you say something that is sort of um, your emotion or your feeling, that's um, being vulnerable, right? It takes courage uh, to do that, and it's risky to do that. Um, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the research and work of Brene Brown. She's gotten super popular nowadays, so you probably have heard of her, but I highly recommend both her books and anything you can find 
online. She has like a Netflix special. I think she just signed a deal to do a show um, like on HBO or something, HBO Max or something. So we'll be seeing more of her as time goes on. But this is one of the things that she's done such a great job with. Her research focused on shame and courage and vulnerability and its impact. And it's profound. It's really profound. And that's why we thank people for sharing. When they're vulnerable, we, we affirm that and tell them we're thankful for that. And then lastly, we maintain our curiosity. I'm interested in learning more. I'm your ally. And I want to join you in finding out the answers to these things. And so we look for some of these conversational cues as we go through the uh, situation. And so those are the some practical things we can do. So that's my that's my my spiel. They told me to keep it to a half an hour and leave time for questions. So that's what I'm trying to do. But I want to leave you with um, it. I'll go back to this slide. I want to leave you with one of my favorite poems of all time uh, by a guy named Edwin Markham. And what I like about this poem is that no matter how other people might be perceiving or treating you, you have, and the poem so clearly shows, this ability to uh, make a different decision in that moment. And I think it speaks to basically this idea of empathy so, so well and so coherently. And that's why I think I like it so much. So anyway, so we can move to questions and um, go from there. I see that we had one comment in the question and answer um, area. Um, love the emotions wheel. Uh, the presentation is super timely, very awesome. Um, but we can we can uh, hold off on a few a few moments to see if we can get any more questions um, come through on the chat. And it's okay if you don't have. All right, so here's a question in regards to business. When would empathy hit the limit where you need to cut and run? That's a really, really good question. And I think those limits are somewhat personal. So it's difficult to answer that I, ideally for other people because each of us is gonna have our own set of boundaries of what we're capable of and what we can, what we can uh, live in, I guess, comfortably, right? And so. A lot of times, you know, somebody might be just fine in a certain environment and it just makes it completely untenable for someone else. So I think there's a little bit of personal, you, you kind of have to know yourself. And so I, I, I would say I would, I would be very careful not to be too directive about sort of what that limit is. But the most important thing is to the idea being, if you're empathetic, it doesn't mean you're a doormat. It means that you are working on creating an environment where other people can do and be productive. But it doesn't mean that like, oh, you have to like, you know, take, you know, everyone's abuse and insults and not, and, and it not, um, not respond to it. So I think you have to judge of that a little bit by your, by yourself and for yourself a little bit. I, I wish I had better answers, but the, the reality is, is we each come from such different places, it would be very, very difficult to, to be prescriptive. Sorry, Ben. That's where you should talk to your friends and things like that. Let's see, did I have any experience um, with how to run the analysis of emotions in the target audience. Um, not sure I totally understand that, um, but I'm going to try to guess. Okay, so I hope I get it right. Um, so sort of, I think it's sort of individual. So I think you, it's sort of a, I think it's a skill. It's a skill you learn over time. And, and the first few times you do it, like any skill, you're like super slow. Um, and so it, 
doesn't feel very natural. It feels awkward. You try different tactics and you sort of learn, see what works. Um, and so that's, um, that's sort of the thing I'd say. Um, and then in terms of like an analyzing emotions, like both in yourself in that moment and in others in that moment, same thing. It's sort of that learned experience of like, oh, I've seen this before. This happens when someone's like, like this or yeah, most of the time. And sometimes you also can, uh, I'm going to say a bad word, but I'm going to say it anyways, which is trust your gut. Sometimes you have great intuition and each of us is different. Our personalities are different. So sometimes your intuition is also a, a helper though, in these cases where you're kind of like, I kind of sense, and sometimes I'll take risks and I'll, I'll even be not quite sure. And I'll sort of, sort of put it out there and sort of say, it seems like maybe there is something, you know, am I, am I picking that up from you and, and open a door and see if that person wants to walk through it. And sometimes it's like, yeah, there is something or no, I'm good. It's okay. We can keep going. So um, yes, I, I think the thing is to get a lot of experience um, and, and keep track of what happens in each time and, and learn from it. All right. I'm kind of just going through these in order. Is that okay? Um, so not an angry person, but there's times when I feel like I'm really getting angry. Are there any cool tactics you can apply so that you get sort of in the right mind frame? Um, yes, but it, it is, um, like the, what's the, uh, there's a movie anger management, right? It has, it has this mantra, goose fraba. I don't actually know if that's the thing, but I think it's whatever works for you. Right. So sometimes I walk away, like I just try to create space. So, um, and so when I feel that, because I do too, like my anger is sort of like, oh, it's rising for whatever reason. And it's sort of like, okay, just, and then breathing, counting to 10, processing and recognizing that I am angry. I don't know if I work like other people work. So I want to just caveat, caveat that. But a lot of times by just admitting to myself, I feel angry right now, that actually helps me a lot. I don't know why, but that, that's what I do. And then, and then the other thing is, um, there's a whole other aspect of this, which is sort of um, it, in um, the world of psychology and cognitive behavioral therapy, it's sort of this idea that sort of like stimulus and response. And we put, um, we try to put sort of why I call it like a circuit breaker in between what's making me, let's say in this case, angry and how I'm going to respond. And that circuit breaker is sort of like a little thing. And that's also a set of skills you can build by learning what are those triggers? What are those things that actually stimulate me to have that emotional response? One of my 90 emotions a day and what I do about it. And that's, uh, that's the thing that um, can work. So again, I think there's so many great tactics and, and um, you know, I think a lot of people could probably share stuff that works really well for them too. Um, so next question, do you strategize with visuals when you want to build empathy in your reports or dashboards? Yes, sort of, because actually building a great visualization or set of visualizations in a report or a dashboard is itself, in my opinion, an expression of empathy, right? We can understand the data in lots of different ways, but our care for taking the time to try to think about how the human mind ingests data and visualizations is part of our empathetic response to lowering the barrier and the risk of onboarding the information. So I would say that it is empathy every time you sit down and think about how to create a better visualization or better dashboard, in my opinion. Um, so anytime you sit down and try to do a little bit better job or think through that problem, I think you're expressing empathy in that way. Uh, and next, what are your thoughts on empathy burnout and ways to minimize or reduce this? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, burnout in general, um, and I think, you know, I don't know everyone on the call, what your experience has been the last year and a half, but I think you've been part of a global pandemic. Uh, and so I'm just a joke, sort of, sorry. Um, 
all of us probably felt really elevated levels of, of this, right? We, we just, just getting through the day. I think we can all remember, you know, if it wasn't last year, it was this year. If it wasn't three weeks ago, it was yesterday. Just sometimes getting through the day was so much uh, to do. And that was its own challenge. And so sometimes reducing that or minimizing that Again, some of that is personal because it's how much it affects you and also what your own resilience level is in those moments. And so you kind of have to fluctuate or figure it out for yourself. But um, to reduce or, or do that is um, find ways to get your mind to kind of take time off. I've heard people say that meditation really helps with this. And I've personally found that meditation is something that I really appreciate and enjoy. I also try to take at least one vacation a year, which is solely for the purpose of relaxing, which is not heavy on activities or going to tourist places. I love those other kinds of vacations too, but at least once a year, I'm actually just trying to be still and thoughtful and letting myself just get through, sort of churn through a lot of the stuff that builds up. Cause that's, Burnout is really sort of a buildup of those emotions that are in our system that we just can't seem to get out. And the, so that's the work we need to do is, is try to do that. Anyways, um, let me keep going. Have you seen training for empathy um, skills and companies that I've worked with? Uh, you know, what's interesting is it's hard to do training because it's so personal. And so I think the first thing, a lot of times companies will do a lot of training around awareness, right? So um, um, you know, building that first set of awareness or understanding of what's going on, but then the work from there of then going and moving that awareness into my own skill set, it actually just becomes really deeply personal at that point. And I, I'm not sure I've seen anything corporate that really tackles that. And it's a weird, weird thing because we, we kind of have a, um, like we all work, we're all what we call knowledge workers, right? Or information workers. We work on computers or ideas are the primary work product that we are creating. And that creates um, lots of overhead in our brains. And I do think, there is a future where we'll have more access to tools like this, but I have not seen them. And again, I'm not on the cutting edge of all this stuff. So, um, you know, maybe someone, um, someone knows something. Uh, when not to be empathetic? Wow, that's a really good question. That's such a good question. There's times where, um, yeah, um, somebody is, if you're in a group setting and somebody's picking on somebody else, that's not the moment to be empathetic to the bully. That's the moment to be empathetic to the person being bullied, right? Or being marginalized. And so maybe that's an example where, you know, one of the, one of the things as, a, as an empathetic person, and this is less to do with sort of business context, but just how interpersonal relationships work and groups work. Um, a lot of times, you know, those kinds of things can come up and it's awful tempting to sort of, you know, duck. Um, but sometimes it's also good to, to, to maybe make a little stance and create some cover for, uh, for people who aren't going to be able to stand up for themselves. So maybe that would be my answer to that. All right, I think we hit it. Yeah, it looks like we are just at time. Um, so I did want to thank you, Michael, for presenting today and for everybody who joined. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add? No, I, I'm thankful. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks for the questions. They're super amazing. And I, I love, I love, love, love analytics in our industry and the people in our industry. So thank you all so much for joining. Perfect. Well, we look forward to seeing everybody at the next SDEC session. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.